Everybody online, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. We're going to get started now. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffitt, and I'm the research program manager at Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon. And you are here joining us for um, our research summit, our research seminar, excuse me. Um, and so just a few logistics here before we get started. I wanted to let you know that your cameras, mics, and screen shares have been turned off. Um, please help us out by keeping it that way, um, just so that we can um, focus on Daniel, who is our presenter today. Um, but if you have any questions, please use the call out chat function. So on Zoom, you can find that either on the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen. You click on the little call out um, bubble and you'll pull up a chat box and you're able to put questions in there. Feel free to put questions in at any time, um, but we'll get to them at the end. But if you have something, put it in there. Um, wanted to also let you know that this is being recorded. And so if you are interested in watching something again or any of our past seminars, you are welcome to go to our past seminar page, um, which is what I just put into the chat. So you're welcome to see that if you would like. Um, the other thing I wanted to just kind of let everybody know is we are gonna take a little break for seminar um, over the holidays. So our very next seminar is going to be January 14th when um, Sylvia Yamada is gonna talk to us about the non-native um, European green crabs in Oregon. Um, she's done an update for us every couple of years. So it'll be interesting to see where we're at now with um, those green crabs. I also wanted to let folks know that that same week, but a little bit earlier, we're gonna have a science on tap event with Sarah Hamilton. And she's gonna be talking to us about how sea star wasting syndrome has impacted the Pycnopodia or the sunflower sea stars. And you might've seen that information come out recently. Um, she just published her results. And so we're really excited to learn a little bit more about that. Um, but today's speaker has been invited to us or brought to us kind of in a, a very nice way by Michael Banks um, through some history. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Michael and he's going to introduce today's speaker. Michael. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, this is a great pleasure. This is our last seminar of 2020. And I'm going to tell you that this is my very first graduate student that I invited to our uh, to join us from Chile. Um, Daniel uh, is now at the Universidad de Concepcion. I hope I say that okay, Daniel. Uh, and that is where he got his, his bachelor's and his master's. Um, I met him because he became a visiting scientist at the University of Hull. And uh, then he came over to our program to do his PhD. Um, and then he moved on to the University of Washington, uh, the Ecological Genomics Lab run uh, by Jim and Lisa Sieb, and then got his, bio, his job back in Chile. And I asked him for a few things to tell me about his more recent news. And uh, he says there that he's an academic scientist and associate professor uh, with broad interest in population genetics and genomics and how Molecular information can be used to illustrate questions in ecology, evolution, and conservation. A large part of his current research focuses on how to study and aid management of non-native salmonids using cross-disciplinary approaches. Uh, he is, I don't know how recent, but he is now director of Inversal, a large group of scientists, students, and professionals devoted to the study of the impacts of non-native salmonids and trout on Chile's ecosystems and society. And I think that's gonna be the topic of today. Daniel, thank you very much for joining us. And I, I'm looking forward to what you have to share with us. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate the introduction and, and the invitation and the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'd like to say two things before starting though. Uh, I would rather be there physically in Newport, for sure. Uh, looking you guys in a room. Uh, and, um, but I understand the constraints, I understand the, the imitations. So this is, uh, this is great as a sort of second option. <laughs> but uh, it, anyway, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and reconnect with many of you guys. Um, and the second is what just Michael said, it's, basically insane to think that I started my PhD in 18 years ago with Michael. It's like crazy. I don't know where the time time went. I mean, it's, I say because uh, 
the memories are so vivid. I mean, I just remember every single probably day that I spent in Hatfield and well, Corvallis as well, but it's just, it's, it's stuck in my head forever. I mean, it was such a great time and such a, a amazing experience for me living those those those, uh, those years in again in in Oregon uh, Corvallis and Newport that said um, what I wanted to talk today is uh, it's something that I'm I'm be working um, uh, lately I don't know what to call it I would say it's a sort of a synthesis perhaps thinking about like a more sort of broad issues going on in uh, in Chile regarding the regarding the invasion of Samonids, you know, some things that may be important to tackle and to, uh, you know, identify first and then perhaps using, using management to start to solve these, uh, solve these issues. Um, well, here you can see several stickers that belong to the many universities. This is not just one person endeavor and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, elaborate on this in the later and during the talk. Um, and the outline basically today is, uh, I'm just gonna spend one slide talking about salmon biology, just because I assume that most of you guys know about this, but just in case maybe there's a member in the audience that is completely unfamiliar to salmon, just to uh, illustrate a few things and set the stage for what is coming later. Uh, then I'm going to talk about Samones in Chile and in Basal. What is, what is this acronym? What does it stand for? And what are we doing? And, and um, challenges ahead. Then I'm going to highlight sort of knowledge, what I define as knowledge gaps. And then I'm going to, I'm going to move into uh, what I've defined as management goals, citing two examples that things that we're doing currently right now, sort of addressing the problem of uh, invasive Salmon is in Chile. And I'm just going to close with a few take home messages um, totally open. I think it's, it's, uh, it'd be great to hear your feedback and comments and uh, either during or at the end of the talk or even afterwards. Uh, it would certainly benefit the, the, uh, the, this particular uh, piece that I'm planning on, on keep on working. So just, uh, just to highlight a few things that I found particularly interesting about salmon and salmon biology and is the fact that they're, they're being massively studied, especially in the native range. So there's a lot of literature and, and information in the areas of ecology and evolution. We have learned so much from, from these uh, species. You know, they, they are migratory animals, they move uh, long distances, sometimes thousands of kilometers, um, or sometimes they do these shorter migrations. Uh, they move between fresh water and sea. Sometimes they move between lakes and tributaries, but they always move in and they use this, uh, uh, occupy these uh, large areas. And they also home, they return to the native areas with great precision, right? We call, phylop we call uh, phylopatry. There's also a significant amount of variation. Some populations, uh, some species reproduce once, so they reproduce multiple times. Um, some species spend uh, very short periods in fresh water, they migrate, or they spend longer periods. Uh, and they also support uh, commercial recreation and, and tribal fisheries uh, in the native range. And this is this also. Uh, similar in the non-native range, in the invasive range, as I'm gonna show, except for the tribal part. There are also high trophic level predators, which means that they will exert, you know, uh, predation in, 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 um, in lower trophic levels. And um, this is probably one of the reasons why they have become invasive successful species around the globe. Perhaps the only exception is Antarctica, uh, but in the rest of the continents, uh, anywhere, if there is water, you will find some on it. <clears throat> so moving on, is Chile is, is certainly no exception. Uh, Chile is, a, as you can see here on the right, it's a long country, right? 
Uh, it spans around 39 degrees of latitude. Uh, it encompasses uh, several climate types. Uh, here in the red colors, you see sort of the typical altiplano type of um, um, ecoregion. Then you have the, in yellow, you have the desert. Here in sort of these light greens and blues, is sort of the semi-arid regions. Then you move into a Mediterranean region where it's hot and you have marked seasons. And then the Patagonia start, the Northern Patagonia and the Southern Patagonia. And then you end up with the sort of the really southernmost region uh, of Chile. And along all this uh, gradient of uh, cli climate types, you will find some on it. They were, they were introduced uh, um, since the 19th century in Chile. And we can probably spend a whole amount of, a whole bunch of time talking about the introductions of Samones in Chile. That's a, it's a also a very attractive subject. Um, the focus was uh, in particular Chiloé. Chiloé is the area that you can see here in the Northern, Northern Patagonia, where's the big Chiloé island right there. Uh, the idea was to develop fisheries and aquaculture in an economically deprived region. There were no economic opportunities for many people and the government thought it was a great idea to just bring these species over and stock rivers and, and lakes and see whether the economy would improve in those, uh, in those, uh, in those places. The result was quite successful. They form naturalized, self-sustaining populations of large size. And uh, they also, they, something also very important is that um, we are experiencing a range of uses of salmonids in different parts, but many of these uses are not very well documented. So we know, and, and Chile is famous around the, the globe for the, the quality of the recreational fisheries, for example, um, but we know very little about how uh, users in Chile um, use salmonids, for example, for uh, subsistence, means of subsistence. They see they don't sell it. It's not a commercial endeavor. And there is also a significant amount of uh, uh, activities related to salmonids that are unregulated. They're just not uh, under the radar of the managers. Uh, basically we could be classified as IUU. Um, with the exception of one that is also I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, talk about today, which is a, a, an example that uh, you could move from an entire illegal sort of path of exploitation to a legal path. Um, so just to summarize what, just, what, I, or what I've just said right now is, uh, so we have Chile there and we have, um, different various ecoregions, you know, the Altiplano, for example, right here, where there's uh, important uh, uh, aquatic systems. We have the typical Mediterranean rivers. We have the so Northern Patagonia and Southern Patagonia. And exposed to some these salmonids, we have uh, a part of our native fauna, our native fishes, which are quite small, you can see. This is a Karachi, a small, uh, really small uh, fish from the Altiplano, uh, doesn't reach very, very large sizes. Uh, well, so we have other ones like this catfish with, down here, also quite small, but also we have pre uh, predators, which is interesting. And we're trying to understand also the relation of these native predators with uh, free living salmonids, as well as the invertebrate uh, communities. We know very little about this too. And as another layer of complexity to the problem, we have a bunch of different stakeholders. We have the occasional fisher, for example, like a shepherd from the Altiplano, which uses perhaps going to the lake to fish a trout for subsistence to get protein. We have uh, small scale commercial fisheries were quite invisible until very recently. We have um, recreational fishers um, who are perhaps the most visible of the, of the old different stakeholders. Uh, we, and, and last 
but not least we have the aquaculture industry, which is quite a, a important player in, in our country. So we are the second largest producer of uh, aquaculture salmon. And all these interests, all these uh, different views need to coexist uh, within one country, within the same uh, areas, within the same, sometimes the same watershed. So this is bound to create, you know, uh, problem discussions and and things that are for us very interesting and trying to resolve. Uh, what what species we have in Chile? Well, we have uh, from uh, from the genus salmon. We have uh, uh, brown trout, and he also have Atlantic salmon. Atlantic salmon is um, is the main aquaculture species in in, in Chile. Uh, is it represents around 70% of the total production, followed by coho salmon in second place and then rainbow trout. We also have the main Pacific salmon species uh, of the genus Oncorhynchus. We have uh, rainbow trout, we have uh, Chinook salmon, coho salmon, and we also have cherry salmon. Um, and finally, we also have uh, some species of the genus Salvelinus. We have uh, brook char or brook trout, Salvelinus fontinalis. And we also have uh, lake char, Salvelinus namaikush. Uh, I wanted to show this because I don't, I've, this is the work of really many, many, many people who form the Invasal team uh, from, you know, associate researchers, to you know, adjunct researchers, young researchers, we have senior researchers, uh, postdocs, uh, PhD students, master students, undergrads, and other ones that are are part of this great team. Uh, of course, they're not all here. I wish they could. I, I need to put keep adding pictures here. I'm I'm behind. I'm sorry. Uh, but the message here is that. Um, it's quite a it's, it's quite a complex uh, also group of, uh, of folks all the interacting different uh, career stages, um, but we're trying to focus focus really on early career researchers. We are uh, about forty eight percent of the workforce of, of, of this group, and it, it has it kept growing over time. So it started in twenty seventeen with about thirty two people, and we have uh, we managed to consistently keep. Uh, Growing and and I'm definitely going to showcase some of some of the results and some of the things that we've been finding, uh, of course, time permitting, um, based on the results of 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 this uh, this wonderful group. Uh, one thing that we are also um, very interested in is in the use of different. Uh, and the use of mixing, mixing different approaches or cross-disciplinary approaches. So we're going to look at one particular site or one particular um, uh, uh, species and population. And we'll try to use different ways of looking at the problem using, uh, using ecology, using genetics, uh, as well as social approaches uh, that are very important for management, uh, workshops, surveys, outreach. The idea is is um, tackle a, a, a problem that it has many, many angles uh, with as many potential methods uh, as possible. And, and has resulted well, and it's what we think is um, um, an important research with greater impact, especially for the communities that are depend uh, on, on these species as well as the decision makers. I'm not looking at the time, but I think it's about 20 minutes. Okay. Um, so just to summarize the, what is the main impetus behind this group is just uh, the main question that we uh, thought about is uh, what and where are the ecological socioeconomic impacts of invasive salmones in Chile? And how can this information be used to develop and implement evidence-based adaptive management solutions and, and, and policy. That's, this is the main question that motivated us in the beginning of the project. And uh, it's quite 
uh, it was quite a challenge because uh, as I show you, it's a very long country. Uh, the, ac the access is not always uh, um, as easy as you may think. Um, as, so it's been, um, you know, and on top of that, you have to put all the challenges during the last year and things have gotten a bit slow. But um, um, we are definitely uh, uh, moving forward and trying to answer this question and, and in the various forms, you know, addressing many of uh, the many knowledge gaps that I am going to present in the next, uh, in the next few slides. Uh, as I showed you before, we have many species, or I would say many, but say several species. Uh, but these species have distinct uh, distributions and importance. Um, um, so we have, for example, rainbow trout. This is all over the country, ranging from the Altiplano all the way to the southernmost areas in the Magallanes, Magallanes region. Brown trout is more restricted, just like Chinook salmon, sort of the northern Patagonia, northern southern Patagonia. Uh, Atlantic salmon is tricky because we know that uh, we, we fish it, but we have no really strong data on whether this is a, a, a naturalized species or we think most of we currently have uh, swimming around is, is uh, escaped some salmon, escaped Atlantic salmon from, from net pens. Um, but we're, we're, we're working on it and uh, perhaps we're going to have some news in the future. Whether it would be us, uh, it, it would be quite uh, um, unique to know that whether we have established Atlantic salmon populations. Coco salmon again is restricted to uh, sort of uh, southern Patagonia. Cherry salmon we have we know very little, but we know that is in some uh, areas in in Aysen region, which is this area here and brook char as well. So we have different distributions. Uh, we know that salmonids are everywhere, but they have this distribution. They have different importance for the different uh, um, activities. Some of them are important for aquaculture. Some of them are not. Uh, some of them are main uh, game fishes, just like brown trout and rainbow trout, really sought out by anglers in particular. Um, Chinook salmon is the is 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 all is the only species right now that being commercially exploded by um, a small scale fishes in one particular watershed. So it's it's quite variable. And 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 the message here is that we think that if if we're going to implement management goals, uh, just meaning uh, control, eradication, other ones, uh, it's important to recognize that uh, this. Uh, local variability and um, the fact that the realities, especially Chile, which is a, a very strong regionalized country, uh, regions vary within the importance. Uh, what is important for a region is not important for another. Similar to what the you know the states uh, states have. Um, so in this in this uh, and in this context, I, I'd like to show later on, um, uh, you know, some management strategies that we use in uh, in particularly two places in Chungara Lake, and the other one is is in the Tolten River, uh, sort of in the central area of Chile. I wish I had more time to show more stuff, but I think we're uh, kind of uh, um, bit of course, restrained by time. I, I wish I could speak longer, but we don't have uh, all the time available. So I'm just gonna move now into showing what are these knowledge gaps that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, what I call knowledge gaps is really, you know, ways of uh, things that are areas that I think they're ripe for research or that could be important to study in the next years. So one of them is uh, uh, mapping the distribution of salmonids and native fishes. Native fishes because perhaps one of the most impacted groups in, uh, and especially in fresh water. Uh, Chile has this 
very particular endemic uh, uh, group of fishes um, because of the degree of isolation of, of, of Chile in, in South America, uh, this uh, allowed the evolution of this particular group of fishes that are nowhere else. Um, some of them are restricted to just one or two basins. Some of them are restricted to just one single lake. So we have one species per lake, which is kind of insane to think about. And in these systems, uh, sometimes salmonids have been uh, have been stocked, and with, of course, uh, really strong ecological consequences. The second one is uh, it's evaluating ecological interactions between native taxa and salmonids uh, in general. So we're talking about salmonids as uh, predators. That is probably one of the main roles, but it's also as prey. Um, and uh, some monitors uh, at the impacts, evaluating the impacts at the ecosystem level. Um, of course, some of the things I won't be able to talk today, um, but I'll be happy to take to talk in another time. Or, or if folks are interested in knowing more about some of this, uh, please uh, we can we can contact me. No, no problem. The third of this knowledge gap is what I call understanding the societal importance of salmon fishes. And here is a very the important component is, uh, is the sort of the perception of the society towards, uh, towards this group of, uh, of fishes um, and how the different also society uses and learns and understand the presence of this species in, for example, in the food. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that too, especially sushi. Sushi is becoming quite the popular food in Chile and I'm gonna show some, some results. Um, and as we move from sort of more basic science towards the top, uh, these gaps also permeate more, uh, more applied science behind uh, in Basal, which is the, the, the developing of methods and policy for the management and control of, uh, of salmonids. And I'm, I'm gonna move into the next slide just to present a few examples of things that uh, we've been doing on how we're filling these gaps or how we're not filling these gaps or where we fail of doing so. So uh, the knowledge gap number one is was mapping the distribution of salmonids and native fishes. And um, the main question behind is, yes, we know salmonids are everywhere in Chile, um, but exactly where's the information to back up that? And um, uh, we realized that uh, there's a lot of fieldwork data available from many colleagues, uh, but it's often scattered. So it's it's in it's in of course published in papers, uh, but it's also in this uh, so-called gray literature, and there is also something that is uh, quite annoying in the in their their uh, in um, in hands of private consultants. There's a lot of people working with the sort of the uh, environmental impact assessment and they are many of the uh, the government demands that they do a sort of baseline and they have information but it's probably everywhere in in different computers and and um, I, I think one of the main goals is try to get all that data. I don't know whether there's a date for this, but we're trying to we're starting to collect data. We start we've started to try to centralize this the best the best way we can. Um, the other thing is also we have information from anglers. We know there is information from fishing guys, hatchery margins, and others, but we don't have an idea where that is available or not. Most likely will not be available. Um, and um, we um, we're probably focused on different types of data as well, like social media. We know that it, that data is available. We're trying to get some algorithm to retrieve data. We know that anglers in particular in Chile are quite excited about using social media to post about vir virtually everything on um, on those uh, these particular groups of, of fishing. 
or particular species. In general, there's a lot of enthusiasm as to share this information and we're trying to also capitalize that. And of course, we have more like refined methods as of late is the use of environmental DNA. And uh, we, we, we've started to develop some of these markers and um, getting some data, but it's, it's also work in progress. I mean, someday the ideal is that you're gonna get this layer of environmental DNA for every catchment in Chile, which is not uh, a small number. It's about 200 catchments and and one day perhaps we're going to achieve that, but we're 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 working on it. But for now, we I just wanted to show you some things that we've been doing. So this is a map from a recent paper that was uh, accepted as a collaborator from Brazil, and she was assembling uh, Livia Tonella was assembling this massive database of neotropical fishes. I mean, she was more interested in sort of the, the full range of fishes in, in Central America and South America. Uh, but we contributed with our, you know, little, uh, uh, we have a, uh, contributed with about 6,000 records of salmonids and native fishes that you can see here. Um, and uh, it was quite, uh, quite the starter for us because we think that this is definitely something that could stand on its own, you know, a database of um, of um, both native and non-native fishes uh, over time. Hopefully we have uh, temporal records as well and see how, how this has been changing. Again, one of the frustrating things is many hidden, still non-accessible databases remain, but we're trying to find and locate those folks and, and try to convince them that they can provide data to us. Um, hopefully we can duplicate this number of records in the next uh, in the next years. We move from multiple species, you know, we're not interested perhaps on which species are where or to study, uh, you know, changes in the distribution of, of single species such as invasive at Chinook salmon. Chinook salmon is one of the perhaps uh, most iconic species in Chile right now, salmonids, uh, together with uh, Andres and Ivan uh, from Department of Fish and Wildlife at OSU, where we're trying to study and using also information from colleagues from five countries. You can see here um, spawning populations of Chinook salmon in, in red. Um, but we also have a whole bunch of uh, sightings, essentially, occurrences, and data from anglers, data from tourist guides and scientists who have been telling us, I've seen this fish, check, check, check out here in the Paraná. That's, that's a river that is super north. Um, so the question is, is this, is, just, uh, is this just one stray? Uh, Chinook salmon that it was found in Paraná, or uh, what does it imply in terms of expanding Chinook salmon distribution? So we're trying to move forward with this. So I, I'm going to move now into the second uh, knowledge gap, which is related to e ecological interactions and the ecosystem role of salmonids. Um, the question behind is uh, what is the trophic ecology of salmonids and their ecosystem role as predators or prey? And of course, um, we're using these using sort of more traditional approaches such as uh, stomach content analysis, uh, or we're using as well uh, stable isotope analysis, which is a more perhaps powerful method, not relying on whether you find uh, stomach contents uh, or you find not enough stomachs to sort of uh, have an idea. But it's also gives you an idea of uh, perhaps short-term and even long-term trends in data if you analyze these different uh, isotopes, carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. So one of the, uh, here I'm gonna show some of the work that I've been, the, one of my students, Selim Musle, uh, a PhD student from UDEC, the University of Concepcion is doing. Uh, we're studying the sort of how this, uh, three species of salmon, you know, rainbow trout and brown trout so coexist and what kind of impact uh, they exert on, especially freshwater communities using, using um, uh, stable isotope analysis. 
we know that you know that Chinook salmon is spends most of the time feeding at sea, and um, they definitely prey on sardines, anchovies, squid, and krill. But we know much less on on what happens in 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 freshwater. And what Salim has been showing here is a comparison between. Uh, you know, this, uh, this is a typical nitrogen carbon uh, uh, plot. Uh, for, in this case, for rainbow trout, this is for brown trout and Chinook. And the brown ellipse is the group of uh, native fishes, whereas the purple ellipse is the salmonid. And you can see the different species definitely impact uh, the freshwater uh fishes differently uh, what we see is the rainbow trout has the very similar trophic niche quite overlap between these two um, brown trout is a bit slightly less but chinook is the one that he has the less impact not surprisingly because uh, is the is the species that spend uh, less time in fresh water has a very short residence time whereas some of the other ones brown trout and rainbow trout can spend their entire lives in, in fresh water. But that's also uh, why we did this is there's also um, very, very, uh, a lot of interest in determining whether Chinook has, uh, uh, as an adult uh, preys on rivers. And we know from the information from the um, um, Northern Hemisphere, that's not the case. And this sort of uh, reinforces that idea. Uh, I'm going to move into the second one, the knowledge goal three, which is understanding the use of this uh, species as, as a resource and the importance for, uh, for the Ch Chilean society. So one of the main questions is what is the importance of the salmon resource for different stakeholders? And uh, we work on a, a series of interviews. Uh, we still haven't implemented some of these region, regional workshops. Um, the idea is also to use the information that we've been uh, getting from the Knowledge Gaps 1 and Knowledge Gaps 2 to, to sort of fill this void. But what we know now is that um, at least four social discourses coexist around some moments in our uh, country. So one of them is the one that is the social discourse from anglers. Uh, which uh, they been they embrace the notion that these are naturalized species. They're part of the ecosystem, but they 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 should be protected. They should be considered almost in the level as native species. The second one is a uh, is the discourse uh, from small scale commercial fishes, which is much sociocentric. is It's really like more pragmatic. They say, you know, this. I know we know this is an invasive species. We know this introduced, but we want to fish it because we don't have a lot of options to fish, and we need to uh, make a living. So we're gonna fish this, uh, but at the same time, we we want to manage it. We since it's the only species that we can fish right now, and this is the case for this particular community. I'll be talking later. Um, uh, we we cannot fish it down completely. So they have sort of intermediate uh, position between sort of we we would, we would we would think about eradication, total eradication, or you know sort of control. Um, the aquaculture industry is very interesting because for them the fact that there are uh, free living uh, salmonids around is not they don't they don't think it's important really. They just that started to change, though. I have to I have to recognize with the late lately with the um, increasing number of scapes from aquaculture, this notion has been slowly changing. This um, they are going from a sort of denialist, this is not important, to a more like, oh, maybe maybe we are screwing up here and we're releasing a whole bunch of fish, and and we should do something about it. And there's also a biocentric, which is the more sort of hardcore conservationist, conservationist, uh, environmentalist, 
a portion of uh, also scientists who say, you know, this, this species should be completely eradicated from our territory. They, they don't belong here and we should do all, everything is our hand for, for uh, to uh, take them out, fish them down or, or, or any other possible approaches, but they don't belong here. Um, so knowledge gap three was also uh, an interesting paper that we um, that we uh, it's about the contribution of these species of salmonids uh, as well as the origin to the human food chain. And here we using we used uh, DNA barcoding and to to try to ID salmonid species in sushi. This was interesting because uh, sushi is quite uh, an important has become in Chile an important um, um, sort of fast food. Everybody eats sushi as a fast food. Uh, and um, we realized that when we used to go and ask about what, this, what species they were selling, they had no idea what they were selling really. So we tried to, this, we tried to assess using DNA barcoding whether, whether uh, what they declare as uh, salmonid was, it, was a species or not. And, and this is what we found. So this is a work by Valentina Brida and Christian Canales. And um, so here is just a few uh, typical uh, uh, RFLP analysis here in, the, in this, in this uh, gel to show that we can differentiate the different species, Atlantic salmon, coho, rainbow trout, um, Chinook. And we visited many, many, dif many different cities and of course, it wasn't that surprising to find that uh, Atlantic salmon is the most cultured species, the, the main aquaculture species, the most uh, prevalent, but not in, not in all places. Uh, um, we also found Chinook salmon, which is quite interesting because as I said, Chinook salmon can only be exploited in one particular watershed commercially. And I don't think the person at the at this particular business had a had a sort of receipt of uh, receiving this particular uh, uh, you know fish or this fish product from that particular watershed. So, and we also know that that's a um, significant uh, uh, number of products that were either mislabeled or misnamed. Uh, his name is they declared trout, but it was salmon or vice versa. And sometimes they didn't know what they were selling, which is the one of the most uh, frequent ones. They had no idea what they were selling. So I think it also shows the fact that um, salmon as a product in Chile is not, that's another, that isn't a lot of knowledge about. Um, salmon is an export commodity for Chile. Most of the salmon just goes out, it's exported, and, and there's no I, I would say a good feeling of what's going on or what people sell here in salmon and sort of in the local market. Um, so that was that was uh, knowledge three. And I'd just like to show two examples of, we think there could be interesting examples as, as goals. One of them is an eradication plan of rainbow trout, excuse me, in the Altiplano. And the other one is is the fishery that I mentioned a few um, a few minutes ago about the this particular uh, 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 fishery that moved from you know from very invisible artisanal fishes to to just the ones that have legal found a legal path for to exploitation. So these are also knowledge gap and um, uh, one of the main uh, people behind the project is Pablo Pablo Rivara, which is a, a master's student. Um, he's been leading sort of the uh, research here with the help of many other PIs. Um, the idea is um, is to um, propose an eradication plan of a naturalized rainbow trout population that is found at 4,500 meters above sea level, which is uh, crazy to think about, uh, in the so-called Shungara River watershed. This, in the, this is the, in the Altiplano. Uh, of course, it's a, we think it's a small system. 
And this has uh, some uh, advantages. For example, it's a, it's a lake area of only 22.5 square kilometers. And I would say, I wouldn't say tiny, but uh, doable. We did already, I'm gonna show some results of what we did for a uh, uh, survey, hydroacoustic survey. The maximum depth is 40 meters. There's only one inflow and no outflow means that, um, do you also know this uh, migratory rainbow trap population? So all the spawning occurs in this particular river. Um, and then the juveniles migrate down to the lake to, to eat. Of course, there's a several uh, cons as well. The, we have, uh, you have the problem of difficult access. This is again, 4,500 meters. Uh, that's the, the issue of uh, hypoxia, uh, opuna. The weather can be crazy there as well. Um, we have to go in certain periods of, uh, of the year because otherwise is uh, you get the sort of the Bolivian winter or you get the other, the other winter. And normally two winters there. So it's the window to visit is, is kind of narrow, narrow, but it's quite a place. It's, it's amazing. I'm gonna show some of the pictures here. So. The main, the main reason for this eradication problem program or this plan of eradication is to protect this species, the Scarachi, which is, uh, is endemic to the lake. It only exists in that particular lake uh, of the genus Orestes and the species is Orestes chungarensis. So important that we name our boat Orestes here. Uh, the boat that we're using for all the, our RV, right? And these are, it's also quite striking the sizes of this particular rainbow trout. This is a resident rainbow trout. These are not steelheads. This is uh, these fish do not migrate to sea, but they are humongous. They they can reach sizes of you know seven, eight, nine kilos. Uh, so they can they can you can see that they are absolutely happy there, and yeah, they are happy because they are eating a whole bunch of orestias. This is a stomach of orestias perdona, stomach of a trout full of orestias, undigested and semi-digested. Um, and this particular project uh, made the news of one of the important papers, the Mercurio. So there's a lot of expectation of whether we can do this. Uh, so we, we, for example, set out a sort of hydroacoustic survey. Some of the, here you can see the sort of the tracks uh, and we use the, our boat and um, an hydroacoustic equipment. And we counted uh, in the different stratum, strata, sorry, uh, in total about 2000 trout. We thought we were gonna be in the tens of thousands, to be honest, uh, or tens or hundreds of thousands, but I don't know. You tell me, but I'd say thousands, it doesn't seem too bad for an er eradication program, we'll see. Um, Something that also we, of course, we, we, we're, we're trying to use gill nets, um, but again, uh, our work has been a bit delayed because of uh, many uh, reasons. One of them is also, what, of course, uh, current pandemic. We have failed to program and um, program uh, field work there again. Hopefully we can do this next, uh, uh, next April. Uh, of course, we are also interested in the, the juvenile phase, and we have here juveniles. Um, here is uh, some sites that we're in electrofishing, and some preliminary estimates is uh, using Carl Strub. The sort of multi pass close population is around 8,700 uh, juveniles. Of course, it has to be extrapolated. To the, to the entire, these are four sites or four reaches that we studied. I mean, it needs to be extrapolated to, to sort of the entire, uh, sort of the areas that are be, can be used by juveniles. Uh, we also wanna use a genomic or genetic approaches, something that's sort of my, my background and we are trying to, um, we have the data already and we try to approach sort of affecting the annual number of active animal breeders to compare it with the population size and see whether we can use this also as sort of uh, base for, for an eradication program. I'm gonna move into the last uh, of the examples uh, showing management goals. And one of them is, is this particular fishery that is, is quite, uh, 
quite interesting uh, and is in the middle sort of uh, central Chile is the Tolten River. And two of my colleagues working have contributed significantly to this, which is Billy Ernst and Luciano Spinoza, student of ma a master's student. Uh, it's interesting because now there's a lot of uh, Nueva Tolten, which is the main city that has become the capital of uh, La Capital del Chinook, means like the Chinook salmon capital. They have this annual championship and everybody wants to go there and take a picture, you know, with this uh, 12 kilograms, 15 kilogram Chinooks. Um, but at the mouth of the river, we have a community of uh, small scale uh, fishes, artisanal fishes, who almost during like an entire decade, actually 12 years, they were uh, fishing. They were fishing illegally uh, Chinook salmon. They were selling it as salmon in the local markets, informal markets, everything kind of really under the, under the radar of the authorities or the authorities sort of looked to the side and had no idea what to do. Um, so this is a relationship that it wasn't, it wasn't very, uh, it's never been a happy relationship. There's always struggle here. But uh, I thought the data was important to sort of illustrate the, uh, how these commercial fishes now in 2017 found with the help of, uh, um, authorities with the help of scientists to sort of, sort of getting the information about catches and getting you know, sort of potential dates where the fishery can, can operate uh, and doesn't interfere with the recreational fishers. Hours of operation um, has become quite the uh, quite an example. He, he made news uh, saying that it was the first fishery in the southern hemisphere. I guess that's New Zealand doesn't have a commercial fishers, so they only have recreational fishing. Uh, so in that sense, it became the first one in the Southern Hemisphere. And what's, what's interesting is uh, we've been there, uh, of course, I only have three years here of data, but um, um, we've been getting data in numbers and weight, and you can see the sort of the typical fluctuations in, in, in population size uh, over years, annual annual variations in sizes. Sometimes they're not the the so the catch duplicate from one year to the other. Sometimes it sort of drops. So it is clearly a naturalized uh, population that we think has been there for I would say six or seven generations, approximately 2005 or early 2000s. Uh, we also been analyzing the sort of the average weights, the ages. Uh, in an effort to sort of develop a, an, an exploitation plan. We also interested in sort of the, uh, the fraction of the, of the population that is not uh, fished or escaped. Um, and we're using scientific echo sounders and did some cameras to, this, to do this. Uh, we've been counting Chinook salmon after they be fished in the mouth of the river as they go, as they continue uh, their journey upstream. And here you can see some of these uh, sort of echo traces showing how the Chinook migrate upstream. So we have also escapement numbers, and this is also important because uh, recreational fishes are constantly saying that the, 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 the commercial fishes, they don't live they don't leave any fish to go upstream and they are blocking the entrance or they want all the fish to themselves. So it's, it's probably something that uh, you guys have been hearing um, in, the, in the native range as well. And we have estimate, estimates of, you know, the run size, uh, sort of total returns. Uh, we also can calculate the exploitation rates which in the first year was quite high according to our calculations, saying 2%, but it's been slowly reaching 40, 30%. And so far we've been getting is that we have, uh, we've been the monitoring of this particular uh, population and, and, and fishery has been quite useful like, to establishing open and closed dates for the fishery defining hours of operation and also estimating exploitation rates. Uh, things that are still pending are, for example, um, escapement goals. We don't have an idea of what is the optimum escapement 
or we haven't been able to define a scheme and goal. You also, uh, many of the authorities and resource managers are worried that there should be some sort of in-season management. Some days maybe the, the fishery should be closed, some days should be open, but it's, it's also uh, something that is not, uh, hasn't been defined yet. So finally, just to reaching, reaching the end of my talk, uh, hopefully uh, it, it was um, uh, interesting for you guys and um, uh, hopefully there are questions and just wanted to say a few things, uh, and just take home messages. One of them is I uh, considering that invasions are really complex phenomena, they, they will likely have ecological and as well as social repercussions. And I think the, the idea behind Invasal and this group of people is uh, scientists, which I'm part of, is, is exactly that, to try to um, address this problem using, um, using these cross-disciplinary approaches. Um, I would say that identifying the knowledge gap is fairly straightforward. It was straightforward, but the, but filling the gaps actually has been quite laborious, considering the extent of the of the sites, the extent of the country that we have. Um, again, the, this cross cross disciplinary work I think is useful to fill these gaps. Um, and we state that the management goals, whether it is eradication or control are definitely more likely to succeed if implemented at the local level. I think it's uh, at the, uh, considering the examples that I presented, thinking about eradication of uh, species is, is quite unrealistic. We probably have to focus on just, uh, you know, populations, which are presented in, in, in the abstract that I sent. Um, and of course, we're always looking for help. We have uh, ongoing collaborations and, but, is there students, uh, researchers, definitely welcome to contribute and enrich our experience. It's just uh, knowledge, acknowledge, you know, the, the, the folks who work with me and um, the funding that is always important for, for uh, to do uh, this research and I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Daniel. I appreciate it so much. Um, folks, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And uh, Daniel, as we're kind of waiting for folks to um, process and put questions in, I had just a quick question for you about yeah. um, the definition of invasion. You know, in the states, like different places in different states look at uh, invaded and invasions and non-native and those kind of distinctions. In Chile, you were using um, invasive so in what is how is that defined Please. yeah well sort of uh, i think terminology is is a bit messy in, in invasion biology but uh what i think it denotes is the sort of different progressions in the in a process or continues so uh, is, is that a species that just arrives in a particular um environment you talk about exotic species but if that particular exotic species now becomes established, you normally say it was uh, introduced or become established. If that particular species now going to the next level, which is um, uh, reproduces and naturalizes and expand its distribution, then then you you started talking about uh, invasion. It's, it's it's probably the ultimate the the last step, um, and it shows that. Once it became established, it propagated and started um, changing distribution. And if the abundance changes, then you have probably more impacts. Thank you. Michael, did you have questions for Daniel? Yes, yes. Yeah, Daniel, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you. I wanted to Thank ask you, so you whether, uh, you know, yeah, it was really wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you about your membership of the Invercell. Have you and your interaction with other places in the Southern Hemisphere where you know we know there are invasions of of salmoners? I mean, rainbow trout are all over the world, and they're mm -hmm. certainly in Africa. But 
You seem to, you seem to be ha have a, uh, a great diversity of different salmonids, and I, I'm not aware of you know, the, many of the Oncorhynchus in, in Africa at least, but how about um, your interaction with, with those other regions and whether they are wrestling with similar problems, maybe particularly in, in New Zealand? Yes, yeah, New Zealand is one of the places that we, um, we have an interaction with uh, uh, Brandon. Brandon Hicks is our, is a senior advisor or senior uh, um, researcher of Invasal. And he actually, yeah, he's, um, he has addressed this, uh, he has, uh, he developed uh, an entire program on, on, um, on invasion biology, especially, you know, the impacts of rainbow trout and, and on native fishes, which are very similar. Uh, uh, our puyas, for example, are very similar in, um, in New Zealand as our, in, in our country, Galaxias, which is a really small freshwater fish um, which can also cannot compete with uh, with salmonids. It's normally displaced uh, once salmonids are in the same in the same habitat. I have not looked into other. We have not looked into, for example, Africa, um, but it may be a good idea. Um, yeah. We to find other examples in other places. We. We also collaborate a little bit now, probably with uh, Beth Fulton from from Tasmania. Um, she also she's, she was very interesting. She was in Chile. Um, she's been in Chile many times and um, and stressing the need of modeling, do a lot of modeling with sort of what happened once the the uh, salmonids are established and. You can potentially do this with uh, with a lot of um, uh, precision and and do predictive establish predictive models for the future how the how the distribution going to change for example. Um, that's that's what I could say, but definitely examples all over the world are, are important for us. Um, if there sorry, are I think question, uh, I I have another one. Go ahead, Michael. Okay, so I, I was also intrigued. You mentioned that one um, population where you're going to eradicate them from a very the, that lake that's very high. That's the plan, yeah. are, are you aware of? Yeah, is that maybe? And I was wondering, maybe more generally in Chile. I mean, it's an you know, invasion of species. Have they gotten to places in Chile? where there is no precedent for existence of you know any of the species in in those ranges anywhere else like i mean i don't know about the global distribution of rainbow trout but that seemed pretty high i mean it was a pretty amazing habitat and uh, yeah um yeah any, yeah any ideas well we, about that? we think we think is the highest is the is the rainbow trap population at the highest altitude? But I, I, I don't want to say it is the highest. It's probably one of the highest. We know that we know that in Ecuador. I, I'm gonna have to check. Uh, I'm gonna have to check and go to the book uh, of the trout and char around the world. Uh, which there's a, a recently published book by AFS about the um, the global distribution of trout and char. And I'm gonna have to check some of those. Altiplano lakes in Ecuador. Ecuador has a lot of altiplano lakes, uh, but I'm and it's there. They have uh, rainbow trout, but I'm not sure whether it's they reach as high as four thousand five hundred. Um, yeah, it's it's if it's remarkable, by any by any means remarkable. Uh, the fact that it became naturalized and the story of how it became naturalized is also kind of like. There's no official. It was uh, it was an illegal introduction. wasn't sanctioned by the government or state, and um, it was just somebody who had a, I think rainbow trout in tanks, and they just he couldn't or she couldn't have him any longer, and she or he dumped it on the, <laughs> the on the lake, and that was it. 
So Daniel, there's another question in the chat box yep. kind of along that is just what is the reaction to the local people around that area to the removal of rainbow trap or the proposed? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, uh, Scott. Uh, it's, it's a great question because um, there's also anglers there, up there. And it's quite, as you can see, you know, I don't know if I show it in the picture, but it's a very nice, the setting is, it's almost like it is, you are in Mars basically fishing. Those who like to go and, and, and are hardcore recreational fishers is like you are, you are uh, fishing in Mars. It's, it's, it's this plateau and it's, there's a volcano there, the Parinacota volcano. And it's beautiful. The only problem is it's like, there's no oxygen. <laughs> Or very little oxygen, so you have to be there for a few days to sort of uh, acclimatize. But um, the, recently, it was as an angling tournament was organized. An angling tournament was organized, I think, back in May 2019, and it's, it was a decent turnout. Like I think 50 anglers with the mission of, you know, the the reason behind was we have to eradicate this. Um, have to eradicate these uh, species. That was what the sort of the the local governor told them. And so it's a, for a good cause, we're gonna go and fish, try to fish as many rainbow trout as possible. So I think it's a good also way of controlling the, the population. Um, how often can you make organize a tournament of 4,500? Also, um, that's also a national park there. So people from national parks are not very happy with when there's a lot of people and, and you can't put boats on the lake so it has to be from, it has to be, uh, you have to, uh, uh, anglers have to do it from the, from the, um, from the uh, coast, right? So you can go in the, you can go in the, in the lake. Um, and so it has, it's a, it has restrictions, definitely. But I think most of the local people and the local anglers are on board. Um, as I mentioned, there's also some subsist subsistence, uh, yeah, did I say right? Subsistence fisheries going on, but we don't know the extent of it. And um, in general, that's the near, the sort of the nearest town is a bit far from there. Um, not many people live in, in the Chungara, you know, in the, in the, I would say that's also a permanent station there of a uh, police permanent station. There's also a, um, there's the border with Bolivia. So there is uh, people from uh, customs, but there that isn't a, a very important population of, of people that are permanent. Thank you very much, Daniel. I just want to recognize uh, folks' time and we're a little bit over. So if you need to oh, go, feel free, feel free to, to sign off um, and everybody will see you um, in a couple weeks when we restart, same place, same time with seminar. Um, but if you want to hang in there for a few more minutes, if you have any other questions for Daniel, please do so. Uh, Michael, do you have anything else you wanted to ask? You seem to have a couple. You're starting to get a couple of uh, good job and thank you so much and nice job in the chat. So. Um, I don't yeah, know. no, thank you. Yes. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> the, yeah, well, Dave is, uh, yeah, I saw Dave actually back in 2015. He let me, he let me in, yeah, the, he let me in into the lab when I was there. <laughs> I was after the AFS. That was great. Yeah, say, great scene, also great scene, Kathleen. And, and Sana was at the, Sana was there too. Yeah, she just stepped, stepped by. Oh, great. Daniel, I, I'm afraid I, I have we run to another meeting, but I just want to thank you again so much. It was really such a pleasure to hear that and so fascinating. Thank I you, Michael. For, I will, the I will make, yeah, and make another time to chat more with you about this. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, the next, ne hopefully, next seminar is in, is, is physically there in Newport. <laughs> yeah. You're always we can go, you. we can go to the Rogue and drink some beer that I miss. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I think that's a great way to end our 2020 seminar series is Dreaming of the Rogue and a little bit of a beer. So um, everybody online, thank you so much. And Daniel, thank you. And Michael, thank you. I think this is your last one where you had classes too. So thank you, everybody. Um, thank you so we'll much. We'll see you in 2021. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.